distinguished chief guest for today's function, Sri Gopalakrishna Gandhi, former governor of West Bengal, distinguished governors and members of the governing body of the Indian Academy, distinguished international faculty, national faculty, delegates, special invitees, members of the press corps and visual media, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, on behalf of the Indian Academy of Otolaryngology and Head and Neck Surgery, let me extend a warm welcome to one and all of you. It's indeed a great privilege and a pleasure for me to welcome our chief guest, Sri Gopalakrishna Gandhi. Sir, in scientific terms, you are the perfect Indian. You have the best genetic inheritance that any Indian could ever aspire for. On your paternal side, you are the grandson of the father of the nation, Sri Mahatma Gandhi, who was the epitome of simplicity, humility, and a person who loved truth. On your mother's side, you are the grandson of Sri Chakravarti Rajagopalachari, who was a man of great intellect, the first Indian Governor General of India, independent India, and one of the men who was responsible for being the architect of independent India. You have combined the best of both genetic trends. In you, sir, I see a person of great humility, self-effacing in every way, a person of tremendous intellect, scholarship, a true academic. And who better than a person of your stature to give his blessings and to inaugurate the first convention of this Indian Academy of Otorhinolaryngology and Head and Neck Surgery. On behalf of all of us, sir, we extend a very warm welcome to you. My heartfelt welcome goes to the members of the governing body, to the international faculty, men of great intellect and scholarship from different corners of the world who have enthralled us this morning and are going to be with us the next two days sharing this tremendous knowledge and experience with us and in the process giving us the benefit of their wisdom. We thank you most sincerely on behalf of all of us here. A sincere thanks goes to the national faculty, again men of great stature, from different corners of this great land, who by the scholarship have distinguished themselves. They are here to share with us their wisdom, their experience, and their knowledge. And I sincerely thank every one of them. Sincere thanks to all the delegates who have come from far and wide, from delegates who have come from neighboring SAR countries. A big thanks to every one of you for being here, because you are the purpose of this academy meeting. And without you, there's no meeting. My thanks to all the, and my welcome to every one of you, the members of the press corps, to the special invitees, and every one of you here, ladies and gentlemen, once again, a warm welcome, Vanakam. We are delighted that the conference is being inaugurated by Sri Gopal Krishna Gandhi, the former governor of West Bengal. He comes from an exalted lineage and is a very well-respected academician. He is a writer, a philosopher, and he has authored several books. I request Professor Mohan Kameshwaran to present a memento to our chief guest, Sri Gopal Krishna Gandhi.
May I now request Sri Gopal Krishna Gandhi to inaugurate the conference and give the presidential address. Esteemed Professor Kameshwaran, distinguished persons from the world of medicine on the dais, in the audience, gathered here from different parts of the country and indeed from outside our borders as well. I offer you my felicitations, my admiring respect and my thanks for associating me with this very important event. I am fairly overwhelmed by the kind remarks made by Professor Kameshwaran in his words of welcome. The fact of ancestry is a fact, but in my case, as in anybody else's case, ancestry is an accidental achievement. It is not the making of the lucky person at all. But of course, ancestry can be mishandled. And one example of how it is not mishandled and how it is augmented is provided by Professor Kameshwaran himself. I was reflecting on the broader backdrop of your concerns and of your skills. And it occurred to me for the first time, which is a reflection of my low IQ, because this should have occurred to me decades ago, that of the five senses, the region with which all of you are so intimately connected and are indeed masters of, take care of a minimum of three of those five and are in close proximity of a neighbor's gentle touch to the fourth faculty of sight as well. And so, if the skull is home to the specific sights of at least three of the five senses, you are in charge of the majority of what may be called the propulsive impulses of a human hominid's life. <laughs> Medicine is about seeking to prevent decay or breakdown, to manage those as they happen and later, and to try to reverse to the extent possible the effect of decay or breakdown. And all this is done by you, distinguished medical persons, in the sure knowledge, uncontested and incontestable knowledge, that despite the possibilities of organ transplant, Decay is inevitable and death is inescapable. And yet, such is the urge to engage the inevitable and the inescapable with the ingenuities of human intelligence that the only adjective that can be used for medical persons is optimistic. Medical persons personify 
optimism. They personify the disposition for hope and a predisposition for improving on what is found to a next higher stage of being, which is near what may be called the best, the optimal. So I am in the presence of creative optimists, of dedicated optimists, who know that within the framework of transience and mortality, there are infinite interstices of resisting transience and mortality to the very fringes of possibility. And so, as you seek to retrieve the possibility of recovery and perhaps of cure from the very often demoralizing debris of setbacks, and as you seek to retrieve the probability of partial or full recovery from the conditions of breakdown, you are speed breakers to what is the inescapable fate of sentient beings. There is therefore something extraordinarily courageous, in fact heroic, about what a doctor and patient, medicament, surgery, and not to forget medical attendants do as a team together, a fact that can get lost in the routinization of the treatment's processes. This is why the perceptions of medicine in the West and in the East from ancient times made the preceptor of medicine not just a medical person, but something of a philosopher. Which is why also I presume that doctors of philosophy, PhDs, in any branch of human knowledge and endeavor are called doctors of philosophy. You are all aware of the great poet Dylan Thomas, whose centenary happens to be this year. He died at the unacceptable age of 39 of a series of medical conditions. But before he died, he wrote this remarkable poem at the spectacle of his father's great and incurable illness. And the poem, as you all know, is called, Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. And that is exactly what medical personages seek to do. They rage against the dying of the light and very often bring dusk back to afternoon and sometimes to the very spring, the median of the day. But while all of you know, and all medical persons and their patients know, that the demise of the individual is foregone, the future of the species and the genera are on a different footing. Unlike animals in the wild, the hominid is living longer and more healthily than before, than earlier generations. But what of the home of the hominid? The planet itself is in greater trouble than ever before. The home is now home to healthier people, but the people inhabiting the home are living in a weaker and fractured home. And this is where an academy such as yours can 
play a very major role because academies, whether they be in the realm of the sciences or of what used to be called the humanities, are institutions of speculation, of reflection, and going beyond that to a communication of reasoned thought. The home of, econ of academies, as you know, in the world of Greece and Rome, was where stadia and gymnasia and the forums worked. Academies functioned from those centers to convey to the people what used to be called the populace, the distilled thoughts of the academicians, of, the, of academia. So I would like to conclude by saying that as you move into what is so appropriately called an academy, you may wish to consider going beyond the particularisms of research, which, as it was described to me in a conversation a few minutes ago, is becoming a finer and finer science. Go beyond that to tell us, simple folk, how to reconcile a science, namely the science of medicine, which is becoming finer and finer, how to reconcile that with a planet which is becoming coarser and coarser as a result of what humans are doing to that planet. I do not wish to speak about global warming and climate change, but you know what I mean. Those are larger descriptions of what is happening all the time. But even in the specific channel of medicine, what is vi visiting us as visitations in terms of pandemic diseases not heard of before needs to be explained to us, not just through newspaper speculative reports, but through the informed, reasoned cogitations of academia. Five years ago, I would never have known of a word which sounds like and is spelt as chikungunya. But having not just heard it, but felt it in every joint and knuckle of my body, I wish to know what it is that has happened to bring it upon us. Friends, I am confident that this academy will not only be a center for the further refinement of what is already highly refined, but a transmitter of urgent messages to a humanity that seeks to know its future within the bounds of its assured transience. I congratulate Dr. Kameshwaran once again and all of you on this initiative which seeks to connect the processes of research with the processes of human thought and the fruits of research with the anxieties of our planet. I thank you.